I was going to start by mentioning a couple of statistics, but the only statistics I'm going to uh, inflict on anybody. Uh, Belfast in 1791 had a population of around 18,000. That's twice what it had in the middle of the 18th century, um, but it still made Belfast roughly one-tenth of the size of Dublin and about one-third of the size of Cork. Uh, if we look at Great Britain and Ireland together, it's just outside the top 30 um, urban centres in the British Isles. Uh, if we jump forward to 1911, Belfast has a population of 387,000, which makes it the largest city, technically at least, in Ireland, and the eighth largest in the United Kingdom. So if you want to look at it that way, there is no question. Belfast's great uh, era of growth is the 19th century, and it is more than anything else a Victorian city. However, there is a lot more involved than simply uh, mere chronology. Uh, over the last 10 years or so, we've seen a uh, huge growth in writing about Belfast. And an awful lot of that growth has taken as a starting point the rich literature that already exists on the British Victorian city. Now, in many ways, that makes sense. Um, if you're going to talk about uh, what happened to Belfast as it was transformed into a major industrial centre, then, of course, it makes sense to look at the experience of Manchester or Leeds or Bradford for comparison. Um, <clears throat> but um, there's also a danger, of course. There's a danger that if we concentrate too much on what Belfast had in common with other major provincial industrial cities, that we're going to miss out on the things that made it different. So what I want to do in this very short and now unillustrated talk um, is to um, is to ask, you know, what are the benefits of um, an approach that takes Belfast as a typical Victorian city? And equally, what are the areas that make it, um, uh, uh, that make it that, where that approach uh, is uh, less uh, productive? Um, though, before I begin doing that, um, it is important to be clear on exactly uh, what is involved in suggesting that Belfast is best seen as a uh, Victorian city. One of the great historical um, discoveries of the last couple of decades is that what happened to British cities in the 19th century wasn't just a matter of scale, more acres of bricks and mortar, more miles of sewer pipe. It was also a cultural revolution. Uh, for centuries, the dominant assumption had been that the city was inescapably inferior to the countryside. The countryside was natural, wholesome, a place of virtue and right living. The city was dirty, smelly, dangerous, a place of sordid commerce, vice and corruption. Uh, in the 19th century, all of that changed. Uh, the first signs of change had come already in the 18th century with what has been called the urban renaissance, when um, towns remodeled themselves as elegant and orderly spaces and began to take pride in their role as centers of culture and polite sociability. Next, there came a revolution in government. Uh, towns had for long been managed by small, unrepresentative cliques. In many cases, um, uh, uh, dominated by a local aristocratic family. Um, but in 1835 in Britain, in 1842 in Ireland, uh, major municipal reform sweeps away that whole archaic system of privileged corporations and puts in their place a uniform system of elected councils, elected by local property owners. So control passes into new hands, a middle-class elite with the vision and the confidence um, to execute and uh, plan and execute major schemes of urban transformation. The first step is to tackle the appalling um, environmental problems created by rapid growth and industrialization, by huge integrated schemes of water supply and waste disposal. Then comes the restructuring of the urban landscape, wider and straighter streets paved and lit, squares and parks to provide light and fresh air, and imposing new civic buildings. Museums, concert hall, art galleries, libraries, all put to rest for once and for all the idea that cities can't be centers of culture as well as commerce. 
And the preferred style of the new buildings is Gothic, looking back to the other great ages of municipal civilization, the Middle Ages when towns were islands of freedom while the countryside was dominated by feudalism and the city-states of uh, Italy in the Renaissance. So that is what we mean when we're talking about a Victorian city. So how well does Belfast fit in? First point to make is that in many ways, the story of Belfast fits quite neatly into the wider narrative I've just been outlining. For example, the idea of an urban Renaissance fits very well for Belfast in the late 18th century, when the Marquis of Donegal uses his influence and power as the landlord to um, turn the town into a showpiece. New leases encourage speculators to, uh, to improve and extend the main streets. Um, you get a purpose-built market at Smithfield, which takes some of the dirtiest um, uh, business of the town, like slaughtering animals, away from the city streets. Um, the grounds of the White Linen Hall, where the city hall later now stands, uh, become a fashionable promenade. You have coffee houses, a theater, cl clubs, literary societies, all turning Belfast into a social and uh, um, uh, cultural center. Um, and in urban government, similarly, we see the same transformation of power that we see elsewhere. Um, Belfast had been dominated by the Donegals, um, who stuffed the unelected corporation with their clients and dependents and ran the town. But from 1801, you got a partially elected police commission, which takes charge of some of the management of the town. And then in 1842, the real turning point, when an elected mayor and council take over from the sovereign and corporation and take control of the town's management. So how did this new elite use their power? Once again, the parallels with what was happening elsewhere are quite clear cut. The new council embarks on a major uh, program of urban development, new markets for livestock and other agricultural produce, removing deadlers, uh, dealers and peddlers from the main streets. You get broad new thoroughfares um, like Corporation Street, driven through a waterfront slum, uh, providing sites for um, commercial buildings and warehouses and taking traffic crossing the new uh, Queen's Bridge from County Down uh, away from the town centre. Uh, you get further street widening and building projects later in the century, notably the creation of Royal Avenue in the 1880s. Um, and as elsewhere, imposing new civic buildings, the courthouse and prison on the um, Crumlin Road, a customs house, a town hall, a municipal library. Um, and the important point there is it's not just local government that's embarking on this um, program of ambitious building. You also get um, private enterprise constructing offices, warehouses, even factories that uh, are not just places to house workers and materials, but also contributions to the urban landscape. Uh, if you go around the back of the city hall, for example, to what's now the Hotel 10 Square, which was built as a linen warehouse by the Jaffe brothers in the 1860s, you will see a very explicit statement of the new spirit, um, because all the way around the building, just above the ground floor, you have busts. Some of the busts are of the heroes of 19th century enterprise, people like um, Robert Peel and Richard Cobden, the apostles of free uh, trade, Jacquard, who uh, invented a new type of loom, um, uh, Stevenson and Watt, the pioneers of um, steam power. But you also have Homer, Michelangelo, uh, Shakespeare and Schiller. The message is clear. Um, there's no conflict between commerce and culture. So we have a city centre that doesn't just look like a British Victorian city, but has very much the same spirit of civic pride and the same confident assertion of the potential of urban living. The third respect in which Belfast stands out as a typical example of a Victorian city is the dominance in its affairs of the middle classes. Um, the elected councils uh, are drawn from the leading merchants and manufacturers of the town. And that gives their management of the town a distinctive character. It means, for example, that they are much quicker to invest in improving projects that will pay for themselves. Things like uh, laying out new streets that will yield ground rents, rather than things 
which will have to be subsidized out of the rates like public parks or public paths. But that is uh, common in industrial cities across uh, Victoria and Britain and Ireland. It's one of the ways that Belfast is typical. And from another point of view, it means that we have, that the management of the town is in the hands of a, um, a substantial men of business who have the confidence and the vision to borrow and to um, initiate large scale uh, building projects. And uh, similarly, the centrality of a middle class ethos is evident in culture. And I don't want to say very much here because Alice will be talking about this in a few minutes, but just to mention, for example, that it's no accident that one of the major new uh, building projects in the mid 19th century is the Ulster Hall with its um, uh, superb acoustics. The concert hall is the quintessential bourgeois institution of the 19th century at a time when Many people regard the theater as suspect on religious and moral grounds. Performances of classical and sacred music give you a combination of culture and sociability uh, in a, situa uh, a setting which is theoretically open to all, but where in practice ticket prices and dress codes ensure you'll only be mixing with the right people. So that's just a brief conspectus of the ways in which, yes, we can call Belfast a typical Victorian city. But at this point, we have to turn to the other side of the story. Because when we look at the Victorian city as it is depicted in modern writing, uh, one of the points that's emphasized is that the imposing public buildings, the statues of local notables, the public pageantry are not just intended to make the governing elite feel good. They're also intended to promote social cohesion and a sense of community by fostering a shared pride in the city and its achievements. In Belfast, however, nothing of that kind is possible. Um, instead, this is an urban population bitterly divided along uh, lines of religion and um, national allegiance. Now, we don't want to pretend to um, uh, construct too static a picture. Um, up to the 1870s, politics in the town was not entirely polarized. Um, the Liberal Party continued to combine the votes of Catholics and Presbyterians. And it's also clear that for most of the 19th century, there is no great love lost between the middle class conservative rulers of the town and um, working class um, Protestants um, in, for example, the Orange Order. But sectarian riots are a feature of Belfast life from the 1820s onwards. And as the century progresses, they become more violent uh, and more lethal. And from the 1880s, with the Home Rule Bill, the first Home Rule Bill, the conflict between Catholic nationalism and Protestant unionism becomes central to political life. What this means in practice is that Belfast might look like a Victorian city, but in many important ways, it doesn't work like one. Instead of colorful festivals that appeal to all parts of the population, like the celebrated Oyster Festival in Colchester, you have the divisive and frequently contested celebration of the 12th of July. Conservatives, later unionists, um, mobilize, uh, monopolize local government. Catholics are almost wholly excluded from the municipal workforce. And buildings, um, the civic buildings are not uh, really public property. There's repeated complaints that Catholics and nationalist groups are excluded from the um, uh, from the Ulster Hall and uh, famously in 1913 uh, the um, uh, City Hall uh, becomes the uh, setting for the great theatre of the, the signing of the uh, Ulster Covenant. Now these sectarian divisions don't just undermine the, um, the, the, the sense of community um, uh, united by civic pride, they also seriously damage the way the city is run. Um, now the conservative dominated uh, town council of the 1840s is already exclusive. It uses all sorts of dirty tricks to keep its liberal opponents out of power. But they're also uh, dynamic and forward looking, willing to set, introduce large scale development projects. But all this comes to a, an end uh, brutally in the 1850s when it is discovered that money which had been raised by under an act of parliament to um, uh, to buy the town gas works for the council. When that deal fell through, the money had been spent on other projects. 
And this was a legal technicality. Nobody had had their fingers in the till. But nevertheless, the Liberals, embittered by years of exclusion from power, uh, launch a crippling lawsuit that paralyzes town government for a number of years and for even longer uh, um, destroys in the enthusiasm for large scale projects. By the 1880s and 1890s, the council has um, regained its nerve. And once again, you have large scale projects like the construction of Royal Avenue. But these tend to be projects that reflect the town's growing sense of its own importance, or alternatively, that will make money, like taking over eventually the gas works and the tram system. Um, <clears throat> in other areas, areas that are very important for the welfare of the local population, progress is slow. I mean, right up to the end of the 19th century, Belfast's water supply continues to come from a random collection of uh, lakes, pools, uh, rivers, and it consistently falls behind rising demand. It's not until 1901 that the work is done to bring a adequate supply of clean water from the Mourne Mountains. And that is um, 42 years, for example, after Glasgow had brought its water supply from Lake Catherine over roughly the same distance uh, to feed the growing city. The lack of a proper water supply also meant that Belfast continued to uh, people continued to use ash pits that had to be dug out regularly rather than uh, water closets. Um, spending on public health is scandalously inadequate. Belfast in 1896 is spending about £15,000 a year on public health. Glasgow, which is roughly twice its size at that point, is spending £100,000. Um, it's not until 1878 um, that Belfast gets around to appointing a medical officer of health and the first two appointments are nakedly political. Uh, people who are appointed for their Conservative Party connections. Um, one of them a former Lord Mayor of over 70, rather than their potential as um, medical experts. Now, in all of this, we do have to be realistic. I mean, it's very easy to pick out shiny examples of the best urban government elsewhere, like Lake Katrine, for example, and then say how Belfast fell short. We do have to recognize that there's other councils where, um, uh, which were equally concerned, uh, more concerned with keeping down the rates rather than uh, the, the welfare of their citizens. But it's hard not to believe that without its internal conflicts, Belfast would have done better. If the council had not been so completely dominated by one party, if elections had not been fought and decided, or had been fought and decided on municipal issues rather than on the eternal opposition of nationalist and unionist. If there had been space for a Labour Party to start making its presence felt as happened in other places. It's hard not to believe that um, the ruling elite would have found it more difficult to neglect public health and other forms of welfare in the way that they did. There are also other more subtle ways in which religious and political conflict acted to prevent Belfast becoming a typical Victorian city. One of the classic um, expressions of civic pride in Victorian Britain was the exploration and commemoration of local history. In Manchester, for example, if you go to the town hall, you can see the splendid set of murals of the history of the town from Roman times onwards, um, uh, commissioned by the artist, um, from the artist uh, Ford Maddox Brown. Um, now Belfast did actually have a good local historian, George Ben, who's book on the history of the city as published in 1877. But it's striking how many commentators on Belfast ignore this and take the line instead that Belfast is a town without history, that it becomes a place of significance only after 1800. Now this rhetoric is convenient in many ways. It links the town's prosperity to the act of union and it um, avoids looking too closely at an earlier period when Belfast is closely linked to um, the rest of Ireland, and for a time as the capital of Irish radicalism. But it's a willful amnesia that deprives Belfast of the opportunity to manufacture a more rounded picture of its past. And the point is reinforced by another strange absence, um, the um, shortage of statues of this, uh, the kind that decorate the centers of most Victorian towns. After the city hall was built, there is a sudden rush to fill up the space around it with a rather arbitrary selection of figures. But up to the end of the 19th century, Belfast only has two 
statues, uh, public statues, both contentious, um, Henry Cook and um, Hugh Hannan, um, where other towns have their civic heroes and a sense of shared history, Belfast has something of a, a void. So to sum up, where does this leave us? Belfast has the architecture and the spatial layout that seem to put it in the same category as a Leeds or a Bradford. But its politics, its community relations, its sense of its own identity are all radically different. So should we abandon the uh, idea of Belfast as a Victorian city? I mean, there are alternatives. Um, Tony Hepburn in his pioneering studies developed comparisons instead with the racially divided cities of the United States. Or we could be adventurous and look even further to colonial capitals like Delhi or Johannesburg with their separate native and settler quarters. And there's something to be said for both approaches, but there's something that would also be lost. 19th century Belfast, as I've tried to show, does not live up to the grand aspirations that are built into the Victorian idea of the city. But if we don't take account of those aspirations, it becomes very hard to account for what nevertheless was achieved. For the um, greater part of the urban landscape we see today, and um, for the ways in which it did manage to um, provide for uh, a tenfold increase in population across the 19th century. So perhaps that where is where we should leave it. Belfast is a place that aspires to be a Victorian city. It goes part of the way to becoming one, but it is held back from fully uh, becoming so by its role as a cockpit of religious and political divisions that extend far beyond its municipal boundaries. Thank you. Stephen, so from um, the, the, the sort of architects of, of, of Belfast uh, and the, the middle classes, um, we're going to move through to, to look at some of the people who didn't experience Belfast in, in quite the same way. Um, on 13th of um, October, 1888, the Lord Lieutenant of, of Ireland visited Belfast in, in full pomp and ceremony. Um, he was there to announce uh, the fact that Belfast had become a city. He declared at a gala, um, Her Majesty the Queen has been graciously pleased to confer on your time the dignity, the honour and title of city. This was indeed a, a proud moment. Um, the fact that at, at this banquet, um, that the Lord Lieutenant had acknowledged um, Victorian Belfast growth and its success and now its status as, as a city. The banquet at which uh, this announcement took place had echoes of another very different banquet that took place in the city just several months earlier, um, only streets away from where such grandeur had been on display yet worlds away in every other sense. Um, this event, as you can see, hopefully in the slide, uh, was dubbed by the local press as the Banquet of the City Arabs. And it was basically the New Year's Supper that it was given um, every year by a number of uh, middle-class philanthropists in the city um, for some of the poorest children in the city. Um, reporting on the banquet, which was held in, in 1888, um, the Belfast newsletter says, I quote, um, it described the unrestrained lungs of nearly 900 newsboys agitated in the request for current funds. It can be imagined, it cannot be described. Another report of um, a banquet, uh, again, for some of the poorest children in the city a couple of years earlier, um, it's almost impossible to find words to describe the scene, which was one calculated to excite a mixed feeling of sorrow and pleasure. Sorrow that so many of the children of our town should be so ragged, neglected and uneducated. Pleasure that our ladies and gentlemen so willing to assist these wretched little ones. So the juxtaposition of these two banquets then, one at which the Lord Lieutenant announced that Belfast was and my city, uh, and then these banquets held for the poorest children of the city, in many ways highlights the great gulf that existed between the ways in which different um, groups in society experienced Belfast's 19th century development. If the late 19th century 
uh, was a high point of Belfast's economic and physical growth, cultural expansion and civic pride. It also represented a time of extreme social inequality. For all those who enjoyed the benefits of Belfast's success, many more uh, experienced overcrowding, lack of sanitation, disease, economic precarity and fear of destitution that went hand in hand with the growth of the Victorian city. And many of this, the city's problems at this stage, uh, I know Sean has outlined uh, quite a few of the, the, the big issues underlining Belfast growth, but I think one of the big problems in terms of the, the sort of social issues was the, the rapid population growth, the number of people who were pouring into the city in search of work, um, and lots of young families in particular, and young women uh, attracted by work in the linen mills, um, uh, the promise of economic independence. Uh, and census figures for 1881 show that there were 24,000 24, style industries, so nearly 25,000 people. Out of these, uh, nearly 18,000 were women, um, of which just under a third were aged under 20. So we see here a lot of young women working in the linen industry in the city. So life for these um, women and for their families was tough and the threat of destitution was never very far away. Wages were low. Um, most work, working class households depended on the income of, of all family members, including the older children, uh, to provide the bare essentials uh, and to pay the rent. In some cases, women were the only breadwinners in their family. So if for whatever reason they weren't able to work, if they got ill, they got pregnant, um, for whatever reason, there was no economic safety net uh, to help them to survive. And absolute destitution for them and their families was therefore uh, a real possibility. So what options then were open to the city's poorest women when, when all else failed? What recourse had they in um, the case of, of absolute destitution? There were really two options um, for most of those who sought shelter and support. One was to seek help from the many philanthropic groups which existed in the city, and the other was to turn to uh, the poor law in the form of the workhouse. So there certainly was plenty of, of middle class philanthropic activity in Belfast in the latter half of the 19th century. Um, on one hand, this period saw the dramatic growth of the Catholic Church in Ireland. Um, on one manifestation of this was uh, the establishment of religious orders across Many of these were, were run by nuns. So in the Belfast street directories for the 1860s, for example, we see a number of Catholic run institutions making their first appearance. Um, the 1865 edition of uh, the street directory lists the Convent of Mercy on the Cronin Road. Um, a Bankmore penitentiary on, on the Dublin Road uh, for the reception of fallen and penitent females under the care of the Sisters of Mercy. And then, of course, the Good Shepherd Convent in Ballinafai, which is still there today to the southeast of the city centre. But Belfast wasn't just another Irish city. Um, it also shared many of the characteristics of industrialising Victorian cities across Britain. And in common with these, it experienced the evangelical revival of the 1850s that swept across um, Britain at this time. And this gave rise to a whole swathe of, of new organisations that were formed for the spiritual and the social improvement of society. Many of them were attached to the main Protestant churches. And, and again, like uh, some of the Catholic organisations I mentioned earlier, they were run by and directed at some of the city's poor women. So again, if we turn back to the street directories for 1854, uh, two editions of note are the Magdalene Asylum, uh, which was attached to Christchurch Anglican Church on the Sandy Row. Um, it was opened in 1849, and I quote, for the benefit of women who could be reclaimed from the court. Uh, another addition at this stage was the Ulster Female Penitentiary um, as well, which was attached to the city's Presbyterian churches. Again, it provided refuge for uh, unmarried mothers. The Belfast Female Mission was founded by a number of churches in 1859 for the purpose of engaging women in missionary work among the town's first uh, families. 
uh, and the Belfast Midnight Mission saw its role uh, as going out actually into the streets at night time to find women who were working on the streets as prostitutes or just out on the street late at night uh, and to bring them back to their halls for tea and sermons. So there's a lot of uh, activity at the time uh, in the city from a philanthropic middle class perspective. Um, but ubiquitous and inactive as these organizations were, they were never going to reach more than a, a tiny fraction of the women who really needed help in the city. Um, their focus was, was mainly on, as we've seen, young women who they deemed to be in need of being rescued from their ways. Um, they had a, an overtly religious and moralistic nature, which may have deterred some people from engaging them. And they just didn't have the resources uh, necessary uh, to help all those women who needed them. For most of Belfast's poor families then, who were in danger of or had tipped over from uh, poverty into destitution, the only real option was to seek help through state welfare, um, which meant basically being admitted as an inmate of um, Belfast Union Workhouse. And here we have a, a picture of Belfast Workhouse uh, from the early 20th century. It is, uh, of course, now um, the very well-known landmark Belfast City Hospital, but it was originally opened as Belfast Workhouse in 1841, following uh, the passing of the Irish Poor Law of 1838. The Irish Workhouse very quickly um, gained a reputation uh, for fear and shame, uh, shame very much being at the heart of what the new poor law was about. Um, writer Joseph O'Connor described the Irish workhouse, and I just quote, the most hated and feared institution in Ireland. And here we have a sculpture uh, in Banbridge, near where the Banbridge workhouse stood. Uh, and as you probably can see from, from the expressions on, on this family's face, it's called family entering the workhouse. And I think it reflects that common perception that the workhouse was somewhere to be feared and dread, dreaded. Belfast Union Workhouse was one of 163 workhouses built across Ireland for the reception of the destitute following the passing of the poor law. Uh, this piece of, of legislation uh, represented the very first form of statutory welfare to exist in Ireland, and its purpose was to deal with destitution, um, not to tackle the problems of poverty. But it was also intended to improve the moral character of, of the poor in society, to instill in them a sense of discipline and hard work. The destitution uh, was rife in early Victorian Ireland um, and there was a general acceptance that, that some form of welfare needed to be introduced, particularly to, to uh, support those who were incapable of, of looking after themselves, uh, for example, the elderly, the infirm or children. But there was this widespread fear that if you introduce any form of statutory welfare provision in Ireland, you will disincentivize the able-bodied labouring poor um, who would then of course take advantage of the system. They'd prefer to live off welfare rather than earning a keep themselves. Um, a discourse that sounds uncomfortably familiar to our ears today, uh, unfortunately. So when the poor law was passed, therefore, it deliberately created a system that was intended to be abhorrent to the ordinary working man or woman, that only the absolute destitute um, would seek relief. So in order to deter all but the absolute desperate from seeking relief, the workhouse test was devised as a core element of the poor law. And what this meant was, first of all, that the only form of welfare that was to be available was to be admitted. Entire families were supposed to leave their homes and be admitted to the workhouse. Um, conditions in the workhouse were to be so unpleasant that nobody would willingly seek refuge there. So uh, food and shelter was to be worse off than the, the poorest labourer outside the workhouse experience. And in addition, um, it was intended that the shame and the stigma attached to becoming a pauper and dependent on the state would act as a, an additional deterrent. So once being all independence and dignity, 
uh, your clothing would be taken away to be fumigated. You would sometimes be made to take a cold bath and you'd be given standard uniform workhouse, uh, uniform, workhouse uniform sorry, to wear. You were supervised during all your working hours um, and each day would be strictly uh, ordered. So paupers were expected to work hard at, at manual labour, breaking stones, digging, scrubbing, etc. for about 10 hours a day in return for food. And the food itself was designed to be deliberately monotonous and of uh, poorer quality, as I say, than the poorest labour would expect um, outside the institution and uh, hopefully on the screen you can see um, the heavily prescribed quantities of food for uh, inmates of the workhouse. This was uh, for Belfast workhouse in 1865. But probably the harshest element uh, of workhouse life was that on entering the workhouse family members were separated and would remain segregated for the duration of their stay. Um, and the plan of the workhouse was such as to fac facilitate that segregation. So men's dormitories would be on one side, women's on the other, and children in a separate wing all together. Uh, you can see here a, a dormitory. This is from Limavady Workhouse, which is one of the smaller ones. Um, Belfast was built to, to house a thousand paupers. I think Limavady was intended for about 600. Um, and basically a dormitory consisted of, of two race platforms along either side of a long room on which uh, would have been thrown straw and then cloth. And you would basically squeeze up beside strangers. Um, and that's where you would sleep. So this idea of segregation and particularly separating um, children from their mothers um, on entering the workhouse was seen as something that would definitely deter all but the desperate from seeking relief. So this is the idea um, of the, the poor law, but the reality um, in the context of a major British industrial city such as Belfast had become uh, was, was very different indeed. Um, by the end of the 19th century, Belfast Union Workhouse was operating on a huge scale. In 1910, uh, for example, there were 29,000 uh, people admitted to Belfast Workhouse. Um, it was operating in a way that was never intended by the architects of the poor law system. It's always difficult for the historian to, to recover the experiences of the poorest in society. But what I wanted to try and do for the last few minutes now um, of, of this paper is, is to focus on those who entered the workhouse and to explore it, who actually used it and how did they um, engage with the welfare system in the late Victorian city. Um, and as I say, it is very difficult to get at these, these poorest people in society. They didn't leave memoirs. Um, biographies weren't written about them and they didn't write letters very often either but one place where we can begin to trace their existence and the, the nature of their engagement with welfare is in the indoor registers uh, for these workhouses massive tomes in which was recorded their name address their age gender religion and how long they stayed in the workhouse and most of these for the north of ireland are still available in the public record office so from this, it's possible to, to get a sense then of, of some of the ways in which the poor of 19th century Belfast engaged with the, the poor law by the end of the Victorian period. Uh, it's a huge topic um, and there's, there's too much to even start to scratch the surface here. But what I do want to do just to give a, a sense or a feel of how people have begun to use the workhouses to look at one month, um, January 1901. Um, and, and to look there at the families admitted and, and how um, people used the workhouse in that sense. So a total of one and a half thousand people were admitted to Belfast Workhouse in the month of January 1901. Of these, 602 were adult women uh, and 228 of these were under 20 years of age. And if you remember earlier, I mentioned the, the extent to which young women under 20 were working as, as mill workers. And I think we can then see by the high proportion of young women under 20 uh, entering the workhouse, just how precarious their existence in the city was. Um, when we look at, at 
entire family groups admitted to the workhouse this month this is particularly interesting because the Irish poor law intended that entire families should go to the workhouse together and that was part of how it was intended to work. Yet when we look at um, Belfast workhouse in January 1901 we see only eight families in total um, and when I say family, I mean two parents and children um, were admitted to Belfast Workhouse, a tiny proportion of the overall number of, of inmates admitted. Four of these families give their addresses as somewhere outside of Belfast. So one was from Killalay, one from Newton Ards, one from Antrim and one from Lisburn. So this suggests that for families migrating into the city, um, who didn't have a home to go to, who hadn't any form of income. The workhouse uh, represented a first stay or point of, of uh, contact for them in the city, uh, particularly if they didn't already have family that they could turn to there. And again, that's something that the architects of the poor law would never have intended it to be used for. Other families seem to have used the workhouse as a place of semi-permanent residence. And again, I think this, this provides a little bit of an insight into the challenges faced by working class families in the Victorian city. So 12 year old Thomas and his four year old sister Sarah, for example, must have been all too familiar with the interior of Belfast workhouse. Just in this one month we're looking at alone, they and their parents were admitted on three separate occasions. And each time they stayed in the workhouse for about a week. And, you know, we can assume that if we go back into 1900 or look forward in the registers through 1901, the same pattern for this family would have been repeated over and over again. Um, and what we see is this, as Peter Mandler has, for example, talked about the fam working class families in Victorian cities just staying one step ahead of the rent collector. Um, when you have no more money left to pay the rent collector, the workhouse then is the default uh, place to go for, for shelter. Another group of young, oh, sorry, I'll go back here. Another group of people um, that, that are admitted to the workhouse and, and they um, make up the largest group, um, again, are the mothers, young mothers, um, particularly admitted alone with their children, and they are by far uh, the, the majority of people admitted in 1901. Um, and again, as, as the case with all the other families we've talked about in family groups, this is not the way the workhouse was intended to operate. And the idea was that the head of the family would take his family to the workhouse, and, and as such, the sense of shame was, was reinforced there um, because he um, was then evidently no longer able to care for those dependent on them. Um, but if we look at January 1901, uh, there were 161 children, um, or 61% of all children admitted that month were admitted with just their mother. Um, and again, this is an indication just of the vulnerability of that group. As some were there because they'd been deserted by a husband and a father. A father could have, have a devastating impact on the family's economic resilience. There were 28 widowed women admitted with their children in January 1901. They're all described as destitute and they all stay in the workhouse for considerably longer periods uh, than, than most other people that, that get admitted. Uh, one particular case in, indicates just how precarious uh, some of these families are when the death of a breadwinner uh, pushed them into destitution. And when George B, uh, a labourer, died of typhus, his wife, 24-year-old uh, Marianne, uh, was left with four children. Um, the oldest of the children was six years old and the youngest was just four months. So she'd only recently then given birth. And the census showed that she and the four children lived in Fleming Street in the west of the city with her two brothers, David, who was 23, and Thomas was 17. So her brother David is listed as the head of the household. Thomas is a 17-year-old. Marianne herself is only 24, and they have four children under the age of six. Um, David worked as a, a labourer and Thomas was a newsboy and with Marianne not presumably working immediately after giving birth to her baby um, and the husband's income now gone due to his death and we can see just how uh, vulnerable this particular family was uh, in, in that case and how much they depended 
on that particular income. So on the 9th of January, Marianne was forced to make um, what must have been a heartrending decision to leave the two older little ones, um, the four-year-old and the six-year-old, with her brothers. And she took uh, the two-year-old and her infant with her to the workhouse where she and they were admitted as paupers and stayed in the workhouse for several months. Some mothers took their children to the workhouse when the husband went to England or Scotland uh, to look for work. And this was strictly against work poor law regulations. It was considered completely unacceptable that ratepayers should be supporting a wife and a family where the husband was still alive. Uh, indeed, poor law guardians actually had the power to go and find and prosecute husbands who deserted their wives. Despite this, women sometimes had to claim that they had been deserted by their husbands in order to receive admission. And there was one case um, that hit the headlines in 1888. Um, a very well-dressed woman, Ellen, was found uh, by them and she had two small children with her. She was asked by the policeman why she was sitting outside the workhouse and she explained that she couldn't support herself any longer. Her husband had deserted her and she had two small children and her only course was to the workhouse. The treatment of this woman led to public inquiry and, and in the public inquiry it actually turned out that Ellen didn't live as she claimed in Greencastle in the, on the outskirts of the city, she actually lived around the corner from the, from the workhouse. Um, she wasn't married so therefore wasn't deserted and these were her two children and uh, according to the report of the inquiry she made a living by parting with her clothes. Um, what's interesting about the case I think though is that Ellen felt the need to present herself as respectable uh, as deserving um, as, as a married woman who had been deserted by her husband in order to have any chance of accessing welfare in the city. Um, and she had to say that her husband had deserted her, uh, otherwise she would have been turned away. Now we do see many proceedings taken against uh, husbands who, who deserted their family. Sometimes they are uh, reunited after a period of time and other times they're not. But sometimes mothers actually took matters into their own hands when, when they felt that their children's health was at risk. Um, uh, when Belfast Board of Guardians started proceeding against uh, John in 1897 for having deserted his wife and leaving her and her children chargeable in the rates, it actually came to light that the children's mother had left her husband against his will and had sought admission to the workhouse because her child was ill and the workhouse hospital represented a very important source of health care for the poor of the city, um, something that would expand considerably into the 20th century. And a final group of women that, that increasingly used the workhouse were young single women with children or who were pregnant. Um, 56 uh, young single women with children were admitted in January 1901. Um, for young women coming to the city, leaving behind security of family or community, there was often nobody you could turn to for help or advice. No one to look after a baby when it was born to allow you to go to work. Um, so becoming pregnant was a major factor in bringing about destitution in the city. And we can see that by the number of, of young women with small children or pregnant women, single women coming to the workhouse. Um, they could uh, hand their babies over in a Magdalene asylum. Some desperate women were driven to infanticide. But for those not prepared to part with the children, um, the workhouse offered temporary shelter for them. And uh, for all the stigma attached to it and the degrading and deeply unpleasant nature of the experience, the workhouse at least allowed young single mothers to find food and shelter uh, and to take the children with them when they left. So to conclude then, by the opening years of the 20th century, Belfast Workhouse was admitting over 20,000 people every year, an increasing number of these people there for medical treatment. Many of those admitted were there for very short term shelter, um, sometimes staying for a night, a couple of nights, sometimes a couple of weeks. Uh, for others with no other option, it seems to have been a, a permanent place of residence. But harsh, austere and definitely unpleasant as it was, the Irish workhouse um, in the context of a uh, 
British industrial city became an increasingly important strand in the network of strategies for survival adopted by the poor. In defiance of the core principles of the poor law, and despite the serious attempt on the part of the authorities to control what they regarded as a massive abuse of the system, the poor increasingly made choices, used the workhouse as it suited them, and resisted the attempts of the poor law to differentiate between the deserving and the undeserving poor. So I would say then, um, thinking about Belfast as a um, city uh, in a Victorian context, um, 19th century experienced energy, um, the way in which the poor engaged with welfare is very much more like the way in which they would have in a big industrial British city, rather than the way the Irish poor law operated in the context of rural Ireland. Thank you. The fact that the statement that the, that the statement that history is actually about the present rather than the past has become trite, as well as seemingly counterintuitive, doesn't necessarily undermine the val valuable message it contains. I'm somewhat wary of many historians' ability or indeed right to comment directly on contemporary society and politics, but I'm resolutely convinced that good history can reflect and contribute to a changing world. Which brings me to Dr. Alice Johnson's book. Fifteen years ago, when I started working for the city hey, Robert, council, Robert, your sides aren't showing. Oh, I'm, I'm going to, um, right. Can I get rid of the bloody things? <laughs> right. Uh, has anybody got a where when I hit share? Um, when I hit share screen, are you getting my? No, we're just getting your face. Oh, well, never mind. Um, let's see. Share. Let's see. How is that? Is that it working? Yeah. Think something I've got a little um, something which is <laughs> saying something's happening. I'm afraid not, Robert. Um. Well, I'll just can I'll just continue then. Okay. Um, Fifteen years ago, when I started working for the city council, the longer story of Belfast was almost invisible. While stories of contemporary and modern political division were commonplace, access to the public sources from earlier periods was hard and expensive which I think impacted on people's already conflicted and contested understanding of their own identity, that of others and the places where they lived and worked. At that stage, council made a small contribution by affordably republishing Ben and the town book and commissioning the first study of Belfast's criminally neglected archeology. span The same time, however, things were stirring up the road as a series of groundbreaking postgraduate studies started to be compiled. The book, we are, the book we are celebrating being a product of one. A major bland part in that process was Professor Connolly's Belfast 400 book, to which council was proud to contribute some funding in partnership with the university and the publisher. The long first chapter, Imagining Belfast, in which Gillian McIntyre also collaborated, skillfully articulates the underpopulated landscape of our standing of Belfast's identity, but even more significantly, why this is important. In support of my first statement, these things contribute to the here and the quotidian, quotidian world of junior public servants. Council, at many levels, is trying to compile a way of saying what Belfast is, both to contribute to the greater cohesion amongst our fractured communities and to lay the foundations of a narrative that can track visitors, helping them connect, understand and engage with our places. I've enjoyed the look of alarm and confusion on the faces of several consultants employed to help with this when I hand them a copy of Belfast 400, and even worse, suggest they read it, rather than solely relying on the nebulous arts and market segmentation. Crucial to the value of both Sean's and Alice's books is their real engagement with ideas of exceptionalism, a real consideration of what is different about our place, but equally important, what aspects of experience we share with elsewhere. Another example of relevance, I'm trying not to say impact, to at least my world, is one of the themes 
in middle-class life in Victoria and Belfast is the move from the private to the public provision of many services, mostly by local government. It's interesting just how little uh, potential interaction there was between the, the citizen um, and centralised government. And in fact, the, the post office uh, was one of the main uh, areas that the, through that was conducted, which is something which somebody ought to perhaps look at in more detail. This process was common across the British Isles, but in Belfast connects both to the 1840s corporation reform and the pressures imposed by the town's extraordinary growth. I'm going to try and expand on that theme by looking at examples chosen that have been the subject of substantial investment by the council in recent times, usually after past neglect. I cannot but suspect that this neglect was at least in part due to an unconscious distancing from the past as well as a lack of understanding and ownership of the value of our historic assets and institutions. Each in its own way picks up on a different aspect of the developing public service provision. Taking them in order of restoration, which is probably uh, slightly mistaken. The first is the restoration of the Albert Memorial Clock completed in 2002, helped with a one billion pound plus Heritage Lottery Fund grant. The Heritage Lottery Fund is a recurring theme and whilst it undermines my argument to some degree, one has to acknowledge that the availability of external funding linked to its recognition of the value of these things was a major factor in prompting these projects. The memorial was a private initiative, though the then mayor denoted, donated his stipend for two years to support the fund. The design was the result of a competition and some shady dealing before it was awarded to WJ Barr. Typically costs were underestimated, in fact, Barr had paid the builder to um, submit a uh, tender under the, what he acknowledged was the actual cost, which came out when, when the builder took a case against Barr's estate to try and recover the money. And the work dragged on past Barr's death in 1867, to the extent that a finished date for the project is hard to determine, but the 1869 achieved some consensus. Members of the royal family rather pointedly failed to make themselves available for any official unveiling before the project limped to a close and the memorial was transferred to the corporation, somewhat reluctantly. Members, uh, very typically, and I think uh, Sean picked up on this, obsessed over running cost concerns, especially the gas lighting of the dial and, and surrounding area. Whilst the famous lean became a concern within 20 years, in fact, continuous underinvestment and maintenance cumulatively was as great a problem, resulting in a much bigger restoration project than might have been the case. One res result beyond the clock itself was the stimulus to the development of the surrounding public realm and an element of placemaking. What is interesting, however, is that interpretation of the memorial itself remains lacking. The next and perhaps more interesting example is the Ulster Hall, which opened in 1862, funded by the Ulster Hall Company with a share capital of £10,000. In spite of the seemingly commercial structure and a misguided aspiration that the venture would be profitable, it also fits into a wider narrative of social responsi responsibility. And Alice deals in some length with, with both the hall and the wider conflicted relationship between middle classes and concepts of entertainment and class. The Northern Whig reported that pro promoters count with reasonable confidence in the support of all who are large employers and who are, are by that position subject to a certain amount of responsibility for the welfare of those under them. For the present movement is not merely for the provision of an additional area, arena of amusement for the upper classes. It is regarded as most desirable to provide a hall of such extent that it can be open for the amusement at a small charge to the classes of our community who are unable to afford the ordinary prices. More arguments support the intentionality of the name that Belfast growth meant that it was the, fact, the de facto capital of the province of Ulster and could expect to attract audiences from far and wide rather than just the town itself. At that stage, Negotiations were underway to acquire the organ from the London Panopticon. Of course, that didn't happen. And Andrew Mulholland spent £3,000 on a splendid instrument with the avowed intention of keeping the working classes out of the pub and fit to attend properly to his spinning machines. A lot of this did not work out. The sum raised built a 
grilled uh, grand spaces with superb acoustics, but not the scheme of decoration as planned. The working classes tend not to, not to be engaged in their masses by programs of classical music and they and their money had to be attracted by other less high flown means. And in fact, the newspaper reports frequently uh, mention rowdyism and, and uh, uh, undesirable behavior um, in the hall, which sort of runs against the, the, the uh, uh, idea that it, was, that it was solely a bastion of, of polite middle-class uh, entertainment. Even these less high flown uh, attractions didn't prove enough. And after years of struggle and inadequate maintenance, the corporation bought the hall in 1902 for 13 and a half thousand pounds, and then spent another 2000 pounds on the upgrades supervised by Robert McGill Young, who, whose family, again, is a prime example of the, of the Victorian middle classes and their diverse cultural and, uh, uh, and professional interests. McGill's influence can be seen in the 13 large paintings which were restored as part of the refurb with historical subjects commissioned from the, from the partnership of Kerry and Thompson. Young was also joint editor of the Ulster Journal of Archaeology when it was revived in 1896. And the paintings hark back to a vision of Belfast before the industrialization, which was, was um, booming all around the center of the city. They show uh, bucolic scenes. And the only one which actually relates to anything near contemporary is a view of the White Linen Hall in the rain. Um, and it's, that, that really stands out again, again amongst the others. In public ownership, the hall flourished, but by the 2000s, bomb damage, neglect, and the dubious aesthetics associated with corporate facilities management had degraded both the physical structure and the cultural connection. Once again, support from the HLF, government, the Arts Council, plus the council, to the extent of £8.7 million, brought a major restoration work to both building and decor, including the paintings. One aspect which caused much hilarity was the reinstatement of the pierced gallery railings, which allegedly were filled in at the request of the British councillors in the 1960s, when miniskirts were in vogue. I've not been able to verify that, that story, but it's too good not to be, uh, not to be uh, entered into the historical record. The basis of the grant application and the scheme was to explicitly open the hall physically and intellectually, restoring its position as a shared and accessible place, hopefully in a return to the ideals of its Victorian promoters. In the event, more recently, the same problems as afflicted the Ulster Hall Company can be seen to return. Linked, or should the word be shackled, to the Waterfront Hall, now the International Conference Centre, and run by an arm's length company, profitability, and rather than whatever the modern equivalent of moral improvement seems to be, have become the priority. Um, the Ulster Hall, I think, had a, had a distinctly Belfast um, character, which was able to cope with uh, the Ulster Orchestra, boxing, wrestling, and up and coming um, uh, uh, rock acts. Uh, and I think we've lost some of that. Right. Uh. So you finished, Robert? No, I, no, I, you know, you're, you're, you're. Um, I was vainly trying to share my screen again, um, <laughs> in the hope because because my best pictures were about to come up. I, no, I'm afraid I'm not finished yet. One of the most charming, enduring and important continuities in Belfast is surely the Botanic Gardens, and they also connect very directly with the key themes of middle class in Victorian Belfast. One of my favourite things which I used to look at in my career in the museum was a small group of material relating to George C. Heinemann, who does make a brief appearance in Alice's book. He's one of the founders of the Belfast Natural and Philosophical Society, corresponded with Darwin, was a member of the dredging group which investigated Belfast law, and survived long enough to become the first chair of Belfast Naturalist Field Club in 1863. BNHPS was founded in 1821 and the Belfast Botanic and Horticultural Society in 1827, with many of the same members and very similar overall aims, translated to an ambition to create a botanical garden. In 
Heinemann was a founder and remained secretary for a number of years. Rather charmingly, some otherwise unknown tickets for the garden survive because he converted them into boxes for his important shell co collection. Other interests included working class education, all typically pursued in conjunction with, with a busy business career as an auctioneer. He was one of the main organizers of the 1852 Belfast Association to be visit to Belfast, the seminal importance of which in both positioning the town in relation to the wider world in terms of science and culture, and by holding up a, a mirror to its own rapidly changing identity has been somewhat overshadowed by the association's next visit in 1876 and the controversy over Tyndall's address. The degree which, to which Alice is breaking previously under cultivated ground is shown by the 10 entries relating to that visit in her index and the degree to which the commercial, civic and other interests mixed gives a real window into the society which she examines who would not have wanted to be on the excursion by ship to the Giant's Causeway led by James McAdam, brother of more famous Robert, listening to cannon shots fired to generate echoes, echoes and sailing back to, in the darkness to Belfast. The gardens tended to point out proudly that they received none of the government funding Glasnevin depended on. While it's often stated that the company always struggled for lack of money, this deserves to be interrogated to a degree as well as purchasing and staffing 17 acres of gardens, employing a series of well-qualified curators with a, with a nicely appointed house, and erecting one of the earliest glass houses to use curvilinear glass in the world, an impressive level of activity was maintained. In one sample year, over 800 varieties of new plants were acquired. A giant Victoria lily was successfully brought to flower, only the second time in Europe. Subsidised admission was offered via employers to those unable to afford the normal admission. The crossover between the different aspects of Belfast middle class life, including Heinemann's, is seen in the, through the same names popping up in apparently disparate organisations, such as the Mechanics Institutes and the Association for Working Men's Education. There is no tension between the cultivation in a private garden of exotic plants acquired through Belfast International Networks and the promotion of working class education. Even after the heyday of the original promoters, some financial capacity is demonstrated by building a new gatehouse in 1872, the purchase in 1881 of a large building that had been used to build gunboats undercover by Harland and Wolfe. And the latter became one of the main venues in the city, a hospital in the First World War and even a barracks for auxiliaries in 1920. Also in the 1880s, another major investment was made in building a fernery, making use of a small natural glen. And this is this structure that we now know as the tropical ravine. The original form was a physical manifestation what, of what was recognized as a craze for ferns, of a scale that made the Killarney fern extinct in its own home, though specimens flourished in the ravine. It's also an example of the predilection for a type of enhanced nature seen in situations from art to domestic interiors. Private provision finally came to an end with the advance of public parks. Ormo 1869, Falls 1877, Woodville 1886, Alexandria 1887, Victoria 1890, and then the botanical gardens were sold to the corporation in 1895 and free at last. Following the same pattern as the Ulster Hall and at almost the same time, Council invested in their new asset, including extended the extending the tropical ravine. Later, however, there was only intermittent investment, including a reglazing in the 1980s, which again came to the rescue with the majority of the money needed for a 3.8 million pound restoration finished in 2018. Interestingly, some of the side effects of the project were a recognition of the importance of the ravine and the gardens and a return to engaging with the educational, conservation and scientific scientific potential of the asset. In the future, long overdue work on the Palm House scheduled. I hope that the gardens can come somewhere that prompts further consideration of the interests and activities of the middle-class Victorians and the debt we owe them. Will I end there in terms of your schedule, um, yep. Stephen? Yep. Or, yeah, uh, I'll just, just do my, my final, uh, little th little thing. Um, I I that I would like to say that that in tribute to all three of the other pa panelists, um, my life and everybody involved in the in the projects which I mentioned 
would have been so much easier if their publications had appeared just a little bit earlier. But, <laughs> but that is like, thank you. <laughs> And thanks to the others. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to their papers today. Um, they've all been supportive of my research um, in different ways over the years. I'd also like to thank Stephen um, for organize, organizing today's event and also the two events in April and May that had to be canceled. Um, also Ian Montgomery of Prony who was uh, helpful in sourcing images uh, for my book. I'm going to talk about my uh, research journey um, by showing some of the sources that I used and that I gathered. Um, hopefully they will be a starting point to discuss some of the themes that my research has covered. When I started my PhD um, quite a long time ago now, uh, Sean, my supervisor, uh, told me to get down to uh, the Ulster Museum um, as soon as possible because it was about to close for refurbishment. Um, we wanted to see what there was there in relation to the social elite of Victorian Belfast. So I got in touch with their curator, Robert. Um, to be honest, I didn't really know exactly what I was looking for or even exactly what I was researching. Those early days are often a case of feeling your way into the research, uh, finding out where it takes you. Robert was extremely helpful. Um, he pulled out several shoe boxes off the shelves um, much of the stuff wasn't actually catalogued, but there was a random assortment of papers, um, mainly from the hindman and tenant families. I would say, though, that the uh, single best source for my research was newspapers. Um, I spent many days in the early days in the newspaper library in Belfast, reading the huge 19th century uh, broadsheets, bigger than any broadsheets I'd ever seen in my life. Northern Whig and the newsletter were the two main newspapers. Over the last five years or so, um, historic newspapers have been digitized and um, the online British newspaper archive, which is searchable and includes a wide range of Belfast newspapers um, has been a game changer in terms of research. But Victorian newspapers reported just about um, anything and everything. And reading them gives an excellent overview of the life of a town and the preoccupations of its citizens. I decided to read the conservative newspaper, um, the Belfast Newsletter, for an entire year. I chose 1847. So then after I'd read that, I had to read the liberal newspaper, the Northern Whig, for the same year. 1847 was an eventful year. Of course, at the height of the Great Famine. It was 170 years ago. Um, yet, if I show you a report from that year, hopefully my slides will work. Um, it may seem in some way surprisingly topical. This report here on the left talks about the increase of fever in Belfast. We regret to state that this malady is rapidly spreading in the narrow streets and entries of this town. We are informed by a good medical authority that the most ravage, that the most fearful ravages of this disease are among the filthy poor. So um, some parallels there with, with uh, Alwyn's talk. Those who are unclean in their persons and in their houses Although want will in a great measure produce this disease, yet uncleanliness will terribly spread the contagion. It goes on to talk about numbers in the overcrowded hospitals and ends with the last little bit. This is a dreadful calamity in as much as the contagion will in consequence spread and perhaps infect the higher classes in society. We are glad to learn, however, that the committee of the General Hospital are about to enlarge their accommodation for fever patients, and we hope the liberality of the town will assist them in their praiseworthy object. Belfast Newsletter, the 23rd of April, 1847. So here we have fear of disease and contagion spreading and a progress report on how fast it was spreading. We can see Victorian preoccupations with health and with cleanliness 
revealing that the sanitary state of the town left quite a bit to be desired in 1847. And it ends with an appeal to the better off citizens to dig into their pockets to create an emergency fund. Ad hoc charity was an essential recourse in the days before a full welfare state. This is a reminder of the challenges facing the Belfast middle-class leadership in a rapidly growing industrial town. The cholera epidemic of 1832 was fresh in everyone's minds and in 1847 things were concerning with a mass influx of famine victims into the town and the dreaded cholera returning alongside typhus fever. If you look at the newspaper cutting on the right, um, hopefully you can see that, you will notice that a public meeting was then held um, in, in May, the next month, to discuss the issue. Town meetings were a frequent occurrence in Victorian Belfast. They were called by the mayor, usually at the request of a citizen, and they were an opportunity to discuss all manner of local affairs. At this meeting, to discuss the spread of the disease, I suspect there were no face masks worn that day, but there was a numerous attendance, including the influential, the great and the good of the town. Town meetings reinforced a sense of communal identity, and they seemed to be an important part of the culture and an important supplement to town council meetings. Yet the gatherings of Belfast Town Council were also democratic in the sense that they were attended by journalists and reported at great length and in great detail in the local newspapers. So the veracity of reports can be tested by reading more than one newspaper's accounts. To me, newspapers give the impression of an open, active, energetic and inquisitive society, at least for the middle class community. As Sean and others have mentioned, Ireland's local government was reformed in 1842. And in Belfast, this meant the old uh, council, which was controlled by the Donegal family, was abolished and a new council was created, limited, uh, elected on a limited franchise of adult males who possessed property of 10 pounds or more per annum. And from this point on, Belfast was a middle-class run town. The major criticism of the town council, at least for the liberal Northern Whig, was that the Tory party kept winning seats. This colored the Whig's view of the town council's actions and it became its strongest critic. During the famine years of the late 1840s, Belfast, which was the only town in Ireland that was growing and not declining, was pressing ahead with a series of improvement acts to build new wider streets, reform and clean up its markets and build a new bridge. And we get two different views um, of this improvement drive by comparing the Belfast newsletter and the Northern Whig. These are two editorials on town improvement. I'll not read them all, but you can see the left, the newsletter took pride in supporting the wide, the wise measures of our indefatigable and clear-sighted town council in improvement acts. Whereas the news, uh, the Northern Wake denounced the enormously costly annual improvement bills devoid of moderation and decorum and said they were reckless, mostly because they increased town rates. With this snapshot, we can see a plurality of voices in Victorian Belfast. And when we're investigating something like town improvement, to find the truth, um, it's the historian's job to try uh, to ascertain. In my research, I was interested in identifying the civic elite. That is those people who were civically active. Those people who attended town meetings, uh, who helped to influence and shape the affairs of the town. Street directories were a crucial source in identifying these people. They tell us where people lived, or at least those people worth noting. They give a valuable insight into the town. What was included in the street and trade directories was obviously what was considered important at the time. Most directories include a short history of the town 
and an account of the state of its trade and business. Many of the town's institutions and societies are recorded, along with a brief history of each of them and a list of their committee members. Directories were clearly for visitors as well as inhabitants of Belfast and a clear sense of civic pride can be detected. Here we have a list of a variety of organisations found in the street directories in the mid-Victorian period. We only have a record of a handful of these organisations today um, in Prony, for example. But for quite a few of these organisations, you can find accounts of their meetings and activities reported in the newspapers. For the Belfast Town Council and the Belfast Corporation, of course, I was able to access the official records at Prony. In the early days of my um, PhD, Prony was located in Balmoral Avenue in a prefab building. Only pencil and pen was allowed into the room, no cameras. It was laborious work. So I'm glad to say uh, Prony has moved on uh, considerably. And now uh, you're allowed to take photographs of documents, which for me has really sped up research. Although having said that, I've been trying to get into Prony for the past three months to no avail, um, with my appointments being repeatedly cancelled. But these are the frustrations and challenges of research, uh, research during a pandemic. So these organisations were the civic lifeblood of the town. And I find that the level of commitment demanded of their members was high. If you take one example, the Town Improvement Committee, which was a subcommittee of the Town Council, seeing as we're talking about town improvement, I find that each member of this committee attended at least one and usually two meetings per week. The meetings lasted on, on average four hours, and they didn't get many breaks during the year. Uh, they met throughout the summer, it met three days before Christmas and four days after it. Membership of these local municipal bodies was demanding, time consuming, and it held no financial reward. So why did these men expend so much time and effort? One suggestion from British historiography is that their primary motivation was prestige. But I find limited evidence of this sentiment in Belfast, especially in the earlier period. For instance, it was not until the 1870s that mayors started to have their portraits painted and hung in the town hall. More important than prestige was the fact that as major ratepayers and large employers, industrialists felt that they had a stake in all of the decisions affecting the town. There was a desire to raise property value and improve the image and reputation of Belfast as a global trading centre. As part of my thesis or my, my PhD research, I made a large database of the civic elite between 1843 to 1870. I listed 838 members of the civic elite. That is people who held membership of at least one organization between 1843 to 1870. As far as I could, I recorded their address, occupation, religious denomination, what organizations they were members of. I also included, which is off the screen to the right of this, because it was a, lo a long uh, Excel spreadsheet. I uh, included data on property value, probate value, or their wealth at death, the names of parents, political affiliation, and where they went to school or university. I was thus able to build up a picture of the civic elite. And this allowed me to analyze data and to try to find patterns. For example, um, here are some pie charts on religious denominations of the civic elite. And uh, the chart on the right shows the wealthiest members of the elite, which were textile industrialists. I should also say that industrialists were also the most prominent civic leaders. Professionals, in particular clergymen and medics, were also highly involved in civic life. <clears throat> 
My PhD thesis was entitled Middle Class Culture and Civic Identity in Mid 19th Century Belfast. But when I started to research my book, after I finished my thesis, uh, quite a few years after, because I, I had two children um, after finishing my PhD, um, I went back to research and I wanted to extend the period I was looking at and also deepen the research in a sense. So as well as other sources, I turned my attention to some family papers, including the Workman family papers, which is an important and rich archive located at Prony. Here are Thomas and Margaret, or Tom and Meg Workman, who moved to Craig Dara, Helen's Bay, in, uh, from South Belfast in 1880. The Workman family were uh, textile manufacturers who moved to Belfast from Scotland originally at the start of the 19th century. It was Tom's grandfather who moved over. Tom worked in the linen industry. His youngest brother, Frank Workman, set up a shipbuilding firm, Workman Clark, for which the family is better known. Their move to Craig Dara illustrates the social mobility experienced by the middle class in general and the elite in particular. It was Tom and Meg's granddaughter, Margaret Garner, who deposited the family papers at Prony. She was an amateur historian. And I'm very grateful to her because middle-class family papers across the UK and Ireland are surprisingly scarce. Reading personal papers gives a deeper insight into the middle class and helps us to understand what made these people tick. From the Workman Archive, I was able to read business account books, business and family correspondence, and even diaries. I want to show you a couple of the sources I found in this archive at Prony and what they can tell us um, about social history. Here we have two documents relating to Tom Workman, a cartoon of Tom as a young man standing in front of the family warehouse in Bedford Street, just opposite the Ulster Hall. And on the left, we have his abstinence pledge. This was a pledge to abstain from intoxicating liquors and to practice, in temp sorry, to practice temperance. The temperance movement was spearheaded in the 1830s in Belfast by the Reverend John Edgar, minister of Alfred Street Presbyterian Church, who was a friend of the Workman family. Temperance led to a major change in Irish drinking culture among both the middle and working classes. The teetotal movement, however, was not embraced by the middle classes who continued to drink uh, wine and champagne. Thomas signed his pledge in 1859 during the Ulster Revival. That year, the 16-year-old Tom, like many Ulster folk, experienced an, evangel an evangelical conversion. He was converted after attending a prayer meeting at Sandy Robe. The revivalist aspect of uh, evangelicalism therefore affected the middle class just as much as the working class. So we have um, his promise to abstain from uh, strong liquors, but that's not to say that young Thomas had no fun. I also found uh, these documents. Um, in the 1860s and 1870s, we see Tom attending plenty of house parties and socializing with other young people. Rather than large public balls, middle-class dancing parties were held in each other's homes. And these are the invitations, beautiful, beautiful um, pieces uh, in their own right. Um, generally, these parties were in the Christmas and New Year season. That was party season. As a young man in the 1870s, Thomas Workman was invited to dancing parties at the homes of elite Presbyterian merchant families, including James Alexander Henderson of Norwood Tower he was the owner of the uh, newsletter. We also see here an invitation to a party in Glasgow um, in January, 1872. 
The workmans had relatives in Scotland who were also uh, business partners and the whole family spent a lot of time crisscrossing the Irish Sea. These invitations indicate that the cultural values of the workman family who considered themselves to be liberal and broad-minded when it came to things like dancing and the theatre were common to lots of other merchant families in Belfast. Here we have the, the dance programme, which was part of the invitation. It was printed out and sent along with the invitation with a list of dances on one side and blank spaces on the other to which names of dancing partners would be added. So we can see that Tom had quite a few dances with different young ladies lined up. Tom also had the opportunity to travel. Before he married Meg, Tom toured North America in 1869 and 1870. He was to travel a lot um, throughout his life for business purposes. But this tour mainly involved a lot of visiting relatives and sightseeing. He kept a journal in which he painted watercolours. And I'm showing you these sources just because really they're very pretty and interesting. So um, on his return, he was able to he give a lecture on his travels to the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society entitled A Month on the Prairies. So I think that's his relatives he's visiting um, in Canada. Like many Victorians, Tom was part of associational culture and he was an active member of the uh, BNHPS and also the Belfast Naturalists Field Club. So, here's a picture of Tom's wife, Meg. Just as I finish, I want to talk a little bit about um, women's history. I actually went to Stratford-upon-Avon to get these photographs, or these came out of a visit um, to Meg's great-granddaughter, Jane Badcock, who was very helpful in filling in the later history of the family. My chapter um, on middle-class women in Belfast is, I hope, a not insignificant contribution to Irish women's history. In this chapter, I discuss women's experience of education, culture, courtship, marriage, motherhood, and philanthropy. I also discuss themes of female independence, self-worth, and female participation in the public sphere. The experience of middle-class women is a lot harder to uncover than that of men. There aren't as many memoirs or biographies, and they are mostly absent from the pages of official and public sources. However, private papers such as the diaries and the correspondence of women, if you're lucky enough to find them, are invaluable because they expose the reality of, woman, of women's lives in a way which official voices do not. I was fortunate to be have access to some of these papers. Of course, Belfast women played a key role in the advancement and emancipation of women in the Victorian period, in particular in the areas of education and suffrage. So names like Isabella Todd and Margaret Byers deserve to be uh, remembered and celebrated. But my research focused on women that no one has heard of or very few. The letters from Meg to her husband, Tom, reveal the pressures and difficulties that marriage and motherhood entailed. Like many middle-class women, Meg juggled household management and looking after her children during her husband's frequent and prolonged absences from home. She seemed to spend inordinate amounts of time sewing clothes for her family. Sewing was a respectable activity for middle-class housewives. In 1889, Meg and her children went to live in Germany for 18 months, much to her displeasure and against her will. Tom didn't join them as he was on a, a very long business trip, apparently trying to drum up business as the company was floundering at this time. It is interesting to note that the ostensible reason for this move to Germany was for the sake of the children's education. 
But the real reason was actually to downsize, to rent out Craig Dara House and to save money. The social norms of respectability dictated that the family should not be seen to be economizing. They had to keep up appearances for business as well as for social reasons. The photograph on the right of the eldest daughters, Jane and Margaret, the twins, was taken in Germany at a time when the family were not, they weren't very happy at that time. The photograph of Meg and her children also bears, silently bears testament to another heartache experienced by Meg. The baby on her lap, her sixth child, was to die just before he reached his first birthday. Infant mortality was common, even among middle-class families. And of all the families that I researched, it was hard to find a single family that hadn't experienced the death of at least one child. Perhaps as a result of this, Victorians were obsessed with health and the majority of the letters I read contained a health report. There was much anxiety about health. Meg had seven children in total and she suffered and experienced a lot of pain while pregnant and breastfeeding. She also experienced a miscarriage. So in reading letters between Tom and Meg, these details such as her miscarriage, her depression, the problems in their marriage is really fascinating, but it can also seem at times almost like an intrusion as I read their private letters, even though these people died more than a century ago. Finally, I'm going to show you a diary um, which belonged to 11 year old Nora Workman, who was a cousin of the Craig Dara Workmans. Nora was the daughter of the Reverend Robert Workman of Newton Breda Presbyterian Church. It's hard not to feel a little guilty um, reading a private diary, even though it's held in a public record office. Nora writes, the 28th of September, 1882, Dear Jen is away to Germany this night. I nearly blotched this book with tears. Dear Jen, she is so beautiful, blue eyes and a fair skin. She is 16, but she is so fond of dolls that this morning we went into town and bought her a doll with real hair stuck to its head. She is taking it to school to play with. Genevieve and Robert went up to see the, the graveyard where my dear mother lies with her baby boy by her side. She was the most lovely la lady ever lived, brown hair, lovely blue eyes. Her cheeks were gifted with a lovely, sweet, sympathetic look on them, so kind, so busy, yet never too busy in the house as to forget the girls in the Sunday school. Mary, our cooked, baked a nice cake this evening for Jen's last tea at home for nine months. The diary was begun two months after Nora's mother, Sarah Workman, the wife of Reverend Robert Workman had died. Sarah died in childbirth, again, a common risk to many Victorian women of any class. And again, we see in for infant mortality in this extract um, as Sarah's lying in the graveyard with her baby, Harold, who died aged two by her side. Just the, from this extract alone, we see different little insights Nora notes that her mother was never too busy in the house to forget the girls in the Sunday school, talking about her Sunday school class. As a clergyman's wife, Sarah had extra responsibilities and many expectations. Indeed, the work she performed for the church, because I was able to read all Sarah's letters to Robert. The work she, she did in the church, often in Robert's absence, was substantial and very time consuming. So it's a window into another world. A 16 year old girl takes a doll with her to comfort her when moving to a foreign country. Like her cousins, Genevieve Workman was partially educated in Germany. And interestingly, um, the Workman family chose Germany as a destination for education for both sexes. And when I analyzed educational data from my database, I found that after Britain and Ireland, Germany was the most common destination for the middle class elite. So that's all I've got time for. Um, I hope that this brief overview has been of interest. And I'm just putting up the discount. Obviously, a lot more is covered in the book. Um, the discount is only available for another week or two.
So I would really like to thank you for listening. Um, thank you for joining this conference and especially for those that are still tuned in um, at this point in the day. Um, if there's time for any questions, I'm happy to take any. Thank you.